Welcome everybody uh, to this uh, joint Anglo-German webinar of Taylor Vessing UK and Taylor Vessing um, Germany. We are here today to talk about the uh, judgment Schrems II by, this, by the CGEU. Um, please let me briefly introduce uh, my co-hosts. Um, uh, uh, Vinit Banish, who is joining us from uh, TW London. Uh, Vin heads our international commercial tech and um, data practice. Also co-hosting is Thomas Karl, a partner in our Frankfurt office, um, tech and privacy lawyer. Myself, my name is Jan Feuerhake. I'm based in the Hamburg office of uh, Taylor Vessing. I also advise in the areas of um, technology and data protection. A little bit about the program that we are going through today, about approximately 30 minutes, we are going to talk about um, the, the judgment, the consequences of the judgment um, in a practical way, also about the reactions by the supervising authorities that have been issued so far. Um, in the course of the webinar, you will have the opportunity to use the question and answer tool of the software and uh, post your questions. And after the official webinar is over f approximately um, half past uh, five Central European time, um, so um, half an hour, we will continue um, with a brief um, uh, question answer session of about uh, 15 minutes where we will answer uh, a few of your questions. Um, so please stick around if you want to join us for this. With that being said, um, let me delve right in to the judgment. Um, our program uh, today, I'm going to give you a brief overview why uh, transfers uh, to third countries are important and under scrutiny. I'm going to talk about uh, data transfers to the US before and after the Schrems 1 decision, a little bit of, uh, about the Schrems 2 decision. Afterwards, um, uh, Thomas is going to talk uh, about a little bit about an analysis of the judgment, also about reactions from data protection authorities uh, so far. Then Vin is going to take over with uh, pr practical implementation, mitigation measures, and what's next. Um, so why is it? Let's, let's take the opportunity now to, first of all, thank everyone that um, is joining today. Um, so um, we're, we're very happy to announce that we have a huge crowd joining today. I think that's that's fair to say, but it certainly reflects the impact of that that landslide ruling. Um, and as Jan was just uh, just about to elaborate on on the legal background uh, for international data transfers in the GDPR, um, I hope we have by now a lot of interesting statements. Um, in parallel, we're always updating what the European Data Protection Board is issuing. So maybe something that we can uh, we can already say right now is that we expect another statement of the European Data Protection Board this week. This is at least what we heard, um, which might be an interesting uh, development here. <clears throat> so everyone's eager to learn whether the European Data Protection Board has um, any ideas on potential workarounds, on potential solutions, on, on what ECG has provided in the ruling um, for all the companies out there, especially for data transfers uh, going to the US. <clears throat> Let us just briefly check if we have information on the well-being of Jan. Yes, I'm back again. There he is. Perfect. Sorry. Uh, Please take I, over. I, I <laughs> have dropped out from this. Um, are we on uh, slide, uh, uh, which slide are we on? Slide five, right? Same, you left it. <clears throat> okay. So um, uh, uh, basically what I was describing are these two levels of um, uh, legality of international data transfers. The one being the data transfer itself, which could, could be a controller to processor relationship, uh, which is privileged which legalizes the data transfer. The other, um, if you're looking at controller to controller transfers, um, then it's, um, for example, Article 6 uh, in the GDPR that you should be looking for for the justification for the transfer. But the second level only applies um, uh, if there's a tr data transfer outside the European Union um, uh, or the European Economic Area. And on that second level is where this CGEU uh, ruling takes place because the data transfer in that case that is outside the EEA, 
is only allowed if there is um, uh, an adequate level of data protection in the respective um, recipient country. This could be by um, an um, uh, EU Commission decision, an adequacy decision, such as some uh, countries have. It could be um, by in implementing measures such as, such as the standard contractual uh, clauses or binding corporate rules, or, and that is the case here, by an adequacy decision that's based on a treaty prior safe harbor, uh, now a privacy shield um, between the U.S. and the EU, um, which, which legalizes this transfer to a third country. This is a little bit of the background why this judgment is so important. Now I'm going to briefly talk about the lead up to the judgment. Um, before uh, uh, we came to this juncture now, there was already um, a, 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 judgment, a, a treaty between the U.S. and the EU legalizing transfers for certified companies um, in the U.S. Um, that was the safe harbor uh, judgment. Um, Mr. Schrems, who's also the claimant in the actual um, uh, current uh, decision, was also the claimant there. Um, he claimed that the transfers from Facebook EU to, the, to Facebook US um, were invalid because of the mass surveillance measures made public um, by Edward Snowden that the, EU, uh, that the US government had uh, established. Um, the CGEU in that case um, agreed with him and said this judgment does, uh, the, the treaty, Safe Harbor Treaty, does not provide sufficient uh, data protection for um, the EU individuals um, and ruled the Safe Harbor Treaty uh, invalid. Afterwards, uh, the um, EU Commission and uh, the uh, US government agreed on a new treaty called Privacy Shield, which put more scrutiny and uh, more stringent rules on U.S. companies wanting to certify um, under Privacy Shield. Um, but again, with this new um, decision, um, Schrems II, the um, CGAU found that this um, treaty was uh, insufficient. Um, the reason behind that um, is, brings us right to the, to the essence of the judgment. Um, the reasoning was these widespread mass surveillance uh, 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 programs by the U.S. Uh, authorities, they have to be followed by the respective addressed U.S. companies. Um, the EU individuals that were subject to this, uh, uh, of, of this, uh, this mass surveillance, they, they do not have uh, any judicial redress under the respective rules in the, in the, in the U.S. So that's the, the main point that the CGEU criticizes uh, with regard to um, uh, the privacy shield, that privacy shield could not provide adequate um, uh, protection for the individuals in the EU um, in the light of these uh, mass surveillance measures. Therefore, um, the court ruled that um, all data transfers to the US based on privacy shield are now uh, to be considered illegal. Um, the CJEU went on in its judgment to also rule with regard to the standard contractual rules. Um, the standard contractual rules, of, uh, the standard contractual clauses of, uh, are also based on an EU Commission decision um, ruling that if these contracts are implemented, these contractual rules are implemented, the Mm, the, the, the transfer to the third country, mainly the U.S., um, uh, should be considered um, uh, ad as with adequate safe, uh, uh, safeguards for the data transfer. Um, the CGEU now ruled that these standard contractual clauses have, uh, are in generally valid because they pro provide adequate uh, protection, but he um, said that the importer and the exporter of the data, so in this case the U.S. company and the EU company that are contractual parties under the standard contractual rules, must assess in the specific circumstances of the case if the standard contractual clauses provide ample protection for the EU citizens whose data is transferred. And it went on um, to state indirectly that where for the parties it is 
not possible to adhere um, uh, to the standard contractual rules um, the, um, are in itself uh, insufficient uh, to justify such data transfer. And in these cases, um, the, uh, the data exporter, the European exporter, must, must stop such transfers immediately. And if it does not so, the supervisory authority uh, can intervene. I'm handing off to uh, Thomas. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so um, what, what can we take away from that? And I think everyone that has, um, has read on the 16th the, um, the grounds of the ruling um, was, was asking the same question. Um, so first of all, what does it, means, what does it mean for, for data transfers to the US? And um, I think our assessment is really clear here. Um, we would say that um, personal data transfers from the U to the US are rarely lawful. Um, meaning that um, it's still obviously under discussion um, whether there might be workaround solutions or not, but we'll come to authority statements just in a minute. Um, and at least the German statements, I think, will reflect that um, most of the regulators seem to take a rather strict approach at the moment. But let's, let's, let's uh, look at that um, in a second. So first of all, privacy shield decision is invalid, um, meaning that everyone that is still basing data transfers on privacy shield will be a no-go at the moment. Um, and some authorities already called immediate action on that, more on that uh, in a second. <clears throat> US law in this area cannot be overwritten, which in fact means in reality um, that obviously there's also a risk using standard contextual clauses or other transfer mechanisms um, for you, US data transfers. We'll, we'll um, say a few words um, uh, in a minute, I guess, on binding corporate rules, which a lot of companies are now asking us, approaching us and asking whether this will uh, still be um, a valid transfer mechanism. So obviously the first question that, that everyone was asking of, after reading that, let's say, shocking ruling was, when does it uh, actually apply, apply from? Will it apply in the minute the ruling came out? Will there be some sort of a mechanism for companies um, to, to get a certain grace period to deal with it. Well, looking at the ECG ruling, I think it's rather clear that the court says there will be no type of a transitional period. It says that um, especially um, the invalidation of, of privacy shields um, will apply immediately, which in fact uh, calls companies to act immediately. Um, but again, obviously, everyone was hoping for some sort of a statement um, for a grace period. Um, for those of you who um, recall what happened back in 2015 when Safe Harbor was annulled, um, at least German authorities granted a six month grace period. Well, I think it's fair to say that the data protection community is waiting for a similar statement now, but still, I think we can, we can say it's, it's unsure. Um, so maybe let's let's take a look at what the authorities um, are saying to the outcome of the ruling. So first of all, on the 16th, starting with statements, was the European Data Protection Board. It was very, um, say, careful in its first statement. It really did not provide a lot of detail. Um, it certainly did not provide um, any specifics on the potential workaround. Um, or a practical solution for companies. So that statement wasn't really helpful, but um, to be honest, I think no one really expected it um, to be at such a short, a short notice to, to provide really reliable solutions. Um, another reaction that we have seen was the European Commission, which also was very careful um, and rather reserved commenting um, on the outcome of it. Um, but now, in Germany at least, everyone was eager to learn what will the German authorities say. And there we had a couple of statements. Um, for those of you who are aware of it, uh, in Germany we have 16 different um, data protection authorities plus the federal data protection officer, um, which typically leads to um, the scenario that we have statements from, let's say, northern states, which might be much stricter than statements from the southern states in Germany. Um, this time it was similar in a way. So we've seen, let's say, two groups of authorities commenting um, on the 16th on the judgment. Um, we have seen one group, which is a smaller group of, of regulators in Germany, which um, gave very strict 
um, interpretations of the ruling of the ECG, but the majority of the regulators have not commented on it by now. Um, one of them, for example, being uh, Hessen. I'm located in Frankfurt, and the Hessen Authority has, um, as of today, not commented on the ruling so far. So the Federal Data Protection Officer, basically the same as the European Data Protection Board, did not give a lot of insight. Um, another statement that at least was uh, really interesting, one of the first statements was the Hamburg Authority, um, which in the end says um, that standard contractual clauses um, should be deemed inadequate. So basically taking um, the argumentation of the ECG ruling and um, directly applying it to um, standard contractual clauses. Um, another statement which I find particularly interesting because I think it will give more food for thought um, is the FAQ that was issued by um, the Rhineland Pfalz Authority. Um, you can look it up on the website of the authority. And in those FAQs, um, the regulator started to differentiate when it came to US data transfers between those companies being subject um, to the FISA Act and those who would not be. So this might be something that afterwards um, everyone will have to take into consideration when thinking of potential uh, workarounds and contingency measures. Then maybe the most prominent statement as of the day of the ruling was the Berlin Statement, which um, was deemed quite radical, but certainly consistent as an all or nothing approach. Um, basically, what the Berlin Authority says was that it demanded an immediate shift um, to European service providers. It's very clear in its statement um, and called um, companies in Berlin on to take immediate action. So that was that was um, 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 that that was seen as a one of the rather strict um, statements. Another statement that we do not have on the slide here, which I just pulled from the internet, would be a statement of Stefan Brink. He is um, the State Data Protection Officer of Baden-Württemberg, um, and he gave um, an interview in one of the major German newspapers in in FAZ. And he did that on Monday. And so he has, he has a lot of interesting insights. But well, I'm just quoting. In the case of the United States, however, the result of the examination, and he is referring to the examination that um, the exporter and the importer under standard contractual clauses will have to make before transferring data to the US, he says, um, the outcome of that ex examination, as to his opinion, is obvious because practically no American company can credibly guarantee that respective access by law enforcement agencies can be prevented. Just quoting um, in one of the major German newspapers this week. What he's referring to... It's like the gremlins in the system are conspiring against us again today. I think we, <laughs> we have lost Thomas. Um, maybe I will just pick up from here. Uh, Jan, uh, and let's see see when Thomas joins us back, because I think he was coming to, towards the end of, of, of talking about the reactions, uh, and we could wrap up once again uh, to our audience. We do apologize, but these technical issues are here to test us from time to time. Um, and looking forward now, and thank you, my colleagues, for bringing us up to speed and explaining how we got here and what the legal and technical issues are at hand. It's clear that the show must go on, uh, which is very easy for me to say as our presenters are falling on and off the show, but the show must go on. The business world that relies so much on technology and global systems and services underpinned by the movement of data and so reliant on US businesses, and we, we can't deny that, whether that's US headquartered supplier, provider, enterprise support, uh, there is no denying the criticality of the decision that in law blocks the data pathway. And some would say we have enough issues, but through the debate there, we even see more challenges coming along the way for other imported jurisdictions outside of the U.S. as well. Uh, and I'm seeing a lot of reporting around, are we on the brink of a data trade war? And some may even suggest that that war started some time ago, maybe even with Schrems one. Some say it's not a war, it's simply a clash of legal systems. Uh, and, and if I'm not sure any one of those descriptions is particularly accurate or all-encompassing, but the latter probably has my sympathy more than the others. However, what are the next steps for you? Uh, technically, businesses that rely on Privacy Shield importers 
you should act immediately uh, as that no longer legitimizes the flow of the data. And we've talked about this. It's no longer lawful. And we're seeing stronger language use that would even suggest, therefore, that those flows to continue would be illegal. Um, and so th th there is more urgency here for those businesses that are relying on privacy shield. However, businesses relying on standard contractual clauses, the SEC, uh, can ill afford to think that they are totally fine. Uh, there is, in fact, uh, t time to, 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 to think more around w whether or not, as we've already seen explained, the fundamental issues around privacy shield collapsing also apply to the same issues under standard contractual clauses. So they, if you have chosen standard contractual clauses above privacy shield, you might think that there is time for you to smoke that self-congratulatory cigar um, to celebrate, but I, I think it might be a little bit premature to do that. But your choice. The tide of uncertainty is clearly visible for standard contractual clauses as well. So what do you do? Look at your data flow maps. And if you haven't done that in a while because you're sick of the implementation of GDPR, time to do it again. Look at them. Assess what is transferred to the U.S. under which lawful basis and how that flow is legitimized. Is that based on privacy shield or is it based on standard contractual clauses? And look at those maps and assess what is transferred. But then what do you do? Then where do you go from there? There are some possible mitigation steps that you can consider. Uh, and we've outlined a some for you on this slide on the next slide as well. Um, Sadly, there aren't that many options, but let us outline them for you. You can stick to the standard contractual clauses. Companies, especially those if you're already relying on SECs, could supplement those clauses with some of the measures and the adequacy requirements on top that this case enforces you to think about. Ensure that there's no increased liability for breaches or exposure to administrative sanctions. And again, you could start to build these on top of your SECs. You could consider a move to BCR. Uh, it provides a lot more legal certainty as data protection authorities have to approve these binding corporate rules, but it requires time and effort, and we all know that. Um, they have a degree of limitation because they are clearly designed for intra-group transfers, but the same weakness is inherently there that also applied and killed the Privacy Shield and also looms over the SECs, particularly with regard to flows to the US, you can start to consider something else. And perhaps consent is one of those. And you can see the Article 49 references that consent is a solution that is actually available uh, and using the consent of the data subject to justify the transfers. But we also know that this is not without its own faults and its own risks. Authorities have made it clear that they consider consent is insufficient for a frequent or large scale transfers. Uh, so look carefully around how you're trying to assess it and how you build consent in for those flows. There are also issues of whether the consent is ever freely given uh, and, and the requirements around revocability. So it's not really suitable for all business models and becomes even more unsuitable in the employee, people, talent, HR environment. So it's a fairly gloomy choice so far. Are there any other options we can begin to consider. Um, you can start to look at developing your own legal opinions of certain U.S. states, start making those assessments around those individual federal states in the U.S. Uh, and, and, and see what that provides you. There are some references that you could look to here. Uh, for example, as we mentioned on the slide, California has a higher data protection standard, and we know it does because of the complexities uh, and the higher baseline that's been introduced CCPA, but there are still fundamental questions around what prevails, particularly where we're talking about the so-called threat and the issues of mass surveillance, which other, otherwise still applies in that nationwide U.S. context. But I think we will start to see more discussion of opinions and assessments in their own right to supplement how you think your SECs may work. There are, of course, the option of, of ad hoc contractual clauses, and the GDPR provides for this. The possibility to establish your own individual SECs, and 
These may, in some cases, also need to be improved by authorities, rather like a BCR process. So, again, you have to think about the process for approval. Could it be lengthy and possibly complex, and therefore that might negate the, the, the viability of choosing that solution? But, again, question whether there are similar weaknesses, as we see to the universal application of SCCs, and we would argue that those still remain. We had to put option six in print for you, just in case you thought you'd misheard us if we stated this and you couldn't see the words. Dare you avoid data transfers to the yes? And we've heard some discussion on this from certain regulators and supervisory authorities uh, across Germany, as my colleagues have already. But we're seeing some discussion beginning to evolve, looking to containerize your data within the EU, looking to, to to maybe even keep the data within the same EU member state of that of the exporter. Um, now, this has been a debate for some time, and often it's a debate when you're looking at commercial arrangements. Why must the data flow? Can we not keep it within the same jurisdiction? It may be time to just reconsider that again. And sometimes it might be, you know, you may think it's aesthetics, but it may still have a value even if you partially do that. Uh, and make sure, for example, the, the either the, the bulk of the transactional data activity, the processing is in the EU or back in the EU, or some of those points of vulnerability where data is transacted outside, such as uh, uh, um, support services, maybe they could also be uh, located back in the EU. Not necessarily new solutions, but we do see these solutions, I think, coming back into conversation and play again. And whilst data transfer restrictions uh, uh, as a legal concept existed way, way before GDPR came to force, and we shouldn't forget that, this overlay of GDPR compliance and government should not be lost here. So think about how you communicate, think about how you document, and think about how you evaluate. And that's this is the frontline obligation that we see, which is the new change from previous directive to new GDPR. And the same conceptual approach and the same practical approach applies here as you consider what you're doing with your data flows, how you communicate that to upstream and downstream, how you're also documenting the steps around assessment and how, again, you're going to communicate that uh, and, and, and whether or not your switch to a different solution will, will allow you to justifiably uh, move to that and take everyone that's part of that flow with you. And, you know, I used the term earlier on data trade war, and it's not my term, but we hear it quite often. And we should just for a moment reflect on the role of politics here, because obviously politics has a huge role to play here. And that's for sure. And if we look at the, the, you know, the legal decision, uh, we've seen that data transfers to the US need to be lawfully possible. We've seen the complexity of Schrems 1 and now Schrems 2. And we've seen how before we were ever, we, 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 we saw how quickly regulators moved to provide certainty, to provide a clear picture of a, uh, of a transitional grace period uh, to allow businesses to to, to just stop, pause for breath, think about the right solution, and move on. Dare we hope that the regulators will do that? They haven't done that in the last seven or eight days, but we still hope that they will. So in some ways, when we look about the politics, and in some ways when we look at the solutions that are available, you may, and you'll be forgiven for thinking, this takes you nowhere, this brings you back to square one, but I would still urge you to look at those solutions and see how this plays out. And if you were playing this as some sort of game, whether it's a game of chess or otherwise, who needs to make the next move on this? Will it be the EU or will it be the US? And in my personal view, I think both finally need to come together and do so very quickly to pave the way for a solution that actually works. And to express a stronger and clearer, very personal view on this for the regulators and all the different supervisory authorities uh, you must do so, and you must get together and give us this clarity, give businesses this, this clarity that they need for businesses to be put in a position where they are simply 
having to consider that what they're doing is illegal, but without having a viability uh, of, of, of an alternative solution or a valid solution, does need regulators to step up to the plate. So forgive me for being blunt, but I would push that challenge out to regulators to do so. And I think to not do so is bad for the EU. It's bad for the US and arguably bad for the data subject. So whatever comes next, whether it's a transitional period to allow us to consider, whether it's guidance on what this assessment may be and what it looks like, we may need to also be looking for whatever the next solution, whatever the successor uh, of, of Privacy Shield looks like and whether there is actually an appetite of trust left in the system to do that. So careful what we wish for. Do we ask for the sword, the protector, the gum shield, whatever it happens to be to facilitate this trade war and the blows and the data that needs to flow from one side to the other? And are there any more twists or turns that we need to be thinking of as far as this equation is concerned? Well, you guessed it. There are still some twists and turns. We shouldn't be shy or ignore the elephant in the room, as we say, the B word, the Brexit situation. And we've already talked in our previous webinars and documented the impact of Brexit and the variations uh, in a non-UK adequacy world that we need to be acutely aware of. And if you haven't already started to do so in terms of practical steps, you can start to consider. Map your flows between your EU member state businesses as exporters and also the UK and vice versa. And assess what you consider would be the best basis to legitimise those data flows. And also consider the position on re-exports as well and what that may do in terms of adding a layer of complexity. Because remember, never before have we had to think about flows of data between countries in Europe. But now, obviously, we have to think about countries in Europe and those that are within the EU and within the Union. And so often we see re-exports viewed as a rather sneaky, sly option. In other words, send the data to the UK and then they will re-export it to the US. I think that's going to be under much more of the spotlight. And the options for Brexit in the absence of an adequate decision for the UK, well, if you're still scratching in your, 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 your head on this, let me tell you, it's still the standard contractual clauses. They don't really have any other viable solution. Um, we did say we were going to make the presentation part of this short and sweet so we can actually also listen and talk to some questions. So thank you very much for listening to our presentation today. While this is a little bit of a whistle stop, uh, we wanted to bring you up to speed and we hope it has done despite the technical interruptions. So we've, we've, we, we can share with you and provide you how we've moved through this particular journey and also share with you our calls for clarity and some brave moves from both the US, the European Commission, and the regulators. And the economies on both sides of the pond need to be moving towards that, uh, at that particular area. And, you know, many of the conversations we're having with businesses, and just in case you're wondering, you know, many businesses are saying, is this not unfair that this burden of assessment now falls on us, uh, either as exporters or importers? And I don't think it's simply uh, a matter for, for exporters to, to assess alone. Uh, importers may need to support exporters into that discussion. Um, and, and so there's going to be, I think, a need for cooperation as we move new solutions rather than simply heavy-handed flow down of, of solutions. So that brings us to an end of the overview that we wanted to present to you. And I can see and you've probably seen my eyes wandering from one end to the other, looking, keeping an eye on some of the questions that are coming in on the screen as well. Um, let me just turn to some of those questions. We've got a couple, and let's see how many we can get through in the time. The first question I see, and maybe I'll just start as I'm still talking, the court specifically did not invalidate SECs, but I just don't understand why you say they are still a problem too. Let, let me just add some of my views on this. Yes, the, 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 the Court of Justice, the CJEU decision, throws uncertainty also over other personal data transfers from Europe to the US. And given the CJEU's statement about the nature of US government access to the private sector data, that's quite clear. Now, whilst the decision upholds the validity of SEC, 
it does require companies and regulators to conduct case-by-case -case analysis to determine whether the import of the third country protections concerning government access do not conflict with the EU data baselines. And we've talked about this, but let me just be clear. This will impact not only companies in the US, but those well beyond as well. So sadly, in some ways, there are more questions than answers right now. But we are absolutely right in saying that there is a cloud of uncertainty over the use of SECs. We are hearing even stronger terminology from SMSAs saying it's not just a cloud of uncertainty, but actually they're illegal and need to stop. But we've tried, hopefully, to try and unpack some of that confusion and clarify some of the options, however unpalatable those options are at the moment. So it's not difficult to see why this gets tricky, particularly for exports to the, uh, uh, to the U.S. Um, and we can see that, I think, as far as SCCs are concerned, these additional requirements around this case-by-case -case analysis. And I mentioned earlier on that, that you know, G GDPR didn't introduce a lot of the new concepts that we have under GDPR. And the requirement for assessing issues that otherwise prevent the flow of adequacy that is determined from European law and that needs to flow through the contractual solutions. Well, that's actually been written into the standard contractual clauses for some time. So in many ways, the CJE didn't need to point that out because it actually exists expressly within the SEC. So it certainly has ruled that the SEC is a valid transfer mechanism, but this additional layer of assessment still exists for SEC. So there is still that cloud of uncertainties. And I'll just continue whilst my eye is looking over the questions. There's a question here about BCRs, actually. Uh, and uh, given that we mentioned BCRs, BCRs that cover our U.S. parent company, well, we're okay, aren't we? Question mark. Well, you know, I talked about smoking, and I was rather uh, tongue-in-cheek, but smoking that self-congratulated cigar too soon. And, and may maybe this is relevant here as well. The problem with data transfers as we now see it under this judgment to US-based companies um, and the issues around US surveillance, well, it calls into question the widespread use of SECs, as we've already discussed. But BCRs are logically subject to the same objection that's been analyzed and raised and concluded, uh, that governments outside, the Europe, outside of the European uh, Union may be exercising surveillance type laws that are not compatible or otherwise conflict with the European baseline, the charter that we have in Europe. So whilst we have no such challenge to BCRs yet, and let's necessarily hope we don't, but that's a hope. Um, and let's hope there is a, a better regulatory and political resolution before there is any form of challenge to BCR, particularly because those companies that have sought BCRs have invested very, very heavily to try and attain this gold standard. So the same issue, we believe, certainly as far as legal analysis is concerned, applies to BCR. Uh, but so it's certainly one to watch as far as the developments go, uh, and, and as we see them maybe change day by day in the days to come. Jan and Thomas, you may have more questions that you can see on your screen. I have yeah. a question. Maybe, Thomas, let me step in. I have a question uh, that relates to Germany directly, so so, so I would be uh, opposed uh, to, um, to answer. The question is, which German supervisory authority's position is the more representative if there is one. So we have seen in the presentation the a kind of extreme point of view of the Berlin authority who's calling upon Berlin-based companies to, to stop immediately uh, transferring data, personal data to the US. Um, uh, uh, that I think is a 
a, a view that is not prevailing with most um, um, authorities. In fact, we have reached out to the Hamburg authority and also uh, to other authorities um, uh, in the meantime and have received a much more moderate feedback. So we we think that uh, they are in a kind of a waiting position as well, looking for solutions for this. We have an unofficial statement from the uh, from the uh, from one of the uh, uh, authorities that they are not going to um, be issuing um, any fines before they can present an alternative solution and i think there's even if there's not a f uh, uh, an official grace period as of yet the mere fact that there's so much data transfer going on and nobody is in the position to to uh, to present a solution that can clear that up um, overnight um, will put a, a natural damper on any efforts uh, of, of, of fining companies. So I think there's going to be, um, even if there's no official grace period, there's going to be a factual grace period by the German authorities um, uh, and maybe the European um, associates uh, authorities as well. We hear that they're talking on the European Data Protection Board level um, uh, about maybe establishing a respective, um, uh, a, a respective grace period. So uh, we think the authorities are not really shocked by this decision, but are also unclear on how to move forward and will move forward in moderation, even where there's a loud bark, but maybe there's not so big of a bite. Yeah, and, and maybe, um, Jan, if you, if you let me add here, and this is something that we heard from the authorities as well, um, when you read carefully the ECG ruling, then you can see that even the ECG said, well, the authorities now have to stick together and use what, what GDPR provides for them, which is coherence, right? Um, so we heard from, from authorities in Germany that they said, well, there are statements that have been issued during the last week, which are rather strict, um, but there might be a statement on a European level, which might then even be binding for everyone. So this is something that, that everyone should also consider, um, obviously depending on, on the level of detail of such a statement, which might come today, tomorrow, or maybe next week. Um, but this is also something I think that 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 everyone has has to keep in mind that maybe such a European joint approach might might then even be binding also for other and maybe more strict authorities um, in Europe or in this case maybe maybe in Germany. Let's let's see what what comes out of that. Um, maybe another question that was raised: Will there be a replacement to Privacy Shield, and should we wait? Um, well, if we look at um, the EU Commission, they say they already talk um, on a, on a uh, EU-US level. Um, honestly, but, but this again is, is more like um, is, is more like just an assumption. Um, looking at the political situation in the US, it, it, it at least seems rather unlikely that um, there will be quick developments at the moment. So, if someone would ask us if it makes sense now to do nothing and wait for another privacy shield. Um, the answer would, for now, I think, certainly be rather no and, and think of other workaround mechanism uh, instead in the meantime. <clears throat> um, another question that I, that I did pick up, and I'm sorry, we have, we have a ton of questions, which is great, um, but can unfortunately not, not, not uh, look at all of them. Um, a, lot of, a lot of questions are obviously around what happens to services that are um, centralized in Europe. Um, services that are hosted in Europe, um, where data access is limited to Europe, um, but U.S. service providers uh, are somehow involved in the service provision. Well, that's that's exactly what I was referring to earlier. Um, I think this is something where the authorities and and also also us and everyone else will will have to, uh, to look into in more detail because this is a scenario that ECG has not explicitly um, addressed. And that um, also brings me to another question that we have here in the list of questions. Um, one of the questions said, well, if um, the ECG now rules, or, or at least it seems to, for data transfers to the US, that this will not be possible, what does it mean for data transfers to other countries that have um, civil, similar law enforcement mechanisms, um, maybe in, in Asian countries? Well. Um, that's that's um, certainly true, and this is something that we, we already heard from authorities as well. There may be one major difference um, 
if we look at the ECG ruling, then the U.S. has been like the present case that the ECG now has heavily looked at and has provided a lot of detail. Um, when it comes to other countries, maybe in Asia, no one has done that exercise so far. Um, so this will certainly take some time before um, authorities will have a clear picture on that. So that, we would believe, is the main difference between the U.S. and other countries that um, uh, may be said to have um, similar uh, mechanisms. Um, so maybe maybe this could be like a first answer to that questions. To my two co-hosts, do we have do we have other questions that we can address right now? So I would a question, uh, but I, I would I would just 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 really at, at, a, at a point because I'm I'm conscious of timing for everyone as well. But you know I, I think yeah. um, you know and and to quote a conversation I had with a client earlier on this point as well. Um, you know that the, the client had said there was a lot of um, there's a lot of panic fueled discussion, and I quoted some conversations and some of my, my my comments on LinkedIn on this point as well. Now is not the time for panic fueled conversations. I think we all need cool heads, we need calm thinking, and we need thoughtful discussion between the different players in the export chain. Um, clearly, there will be more developments on this point, and we at Telewessing and our whole team will continue to bring those developments to you, either through webinars or our ongoing engagement with you through our news bulletins and so on. So I just wanted to add that point because I know that at the moment it seems that there is almost a sense of panic, and I can totally see why. And what it needs actually is a little bit of thoughtful thinking around how to proceed and taking steps immediately on that rather than going into a bit of a tornado head spin. I think these are uh, wonderful words to uh, finish us on um, uh, because the timing has progressed somewhat from what we originally scheduled. Um, I again apologize uh, for the technical difficulties that we've been uh, faced with, uh, but I want to thank you for your attention. Um, we will uh, circulate the presentation as well as a recording of the presentation, um, uh, the webinar itself, uh, to all participants and to those who could not make it uh, but were registered uh, for the, the webinar. So um, thank you again for your um, uh, patience with us. And uh, thank you also to my co-hosts, Thomas and Vin. Um, uh, hope to speak to all of you uh, soon. Please stay safe and healthy. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.